Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Paul B., and I'm a recovering alcoholic. Hey, and my sobriety date is September 24th, 1997, and I'm uh, glad to be here tonight. You know, I always like to start with a couple jokes, just kind of open up. And uh, you know, the first one I have is about a couple women that like to drink. And these women are friends, and their husbands are friends, and they're really fortunate in that they live really close to a lot of bars. And so they can walk and, and get, go home and not have to worry about a DUI or whatever. And they close down a bar one night, just like 2 in the morning. They're walking home, stumbling home, right? And the one uh, one woman leans over to the other and says, I gotta go pee. And the other woman goes, you know, I gotta go too. She said, well, what are we gonna do? Well, I can't make it home. So they look around with a keen alcoholic mind and they notice there's a cemetery right there. And they think, well, nobody's gonna be in a cemetery late at night. We'll just go, we'll just go in there and go. So they're in there and they're going. And uh, the one woman, it occurs to her, she says, oh my gosh, I just realized there's no toilet paper. And she says, well, I guess I'll just use my underwear. And the other woman goes, oh, here's a ribbon on a wreath. I'll just use that, you know. And um, we're like MacGyver, aren't we? And um, so they go home and pass out. Now, the husbands who are friends talk on the phone pretty regularly. So they're on the phone the next day, and Jim says to Bob, he says, i got to be honest. You know, I trust my wife, he said, but I'm really getting worried about the girls going out. He said, this morning I woke up. And Nancy didn't have any underwear on. So I'm kind of concerned. And Bob sounded pretty rough. He said, I'll be honest. He said, I'm a little more concerned. He said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, this morning, he said, Sharon, she had her panties on. The problem was inside there was a card that said from all of us at the fire department, we're really going to miss you. Perception uh, can be, re- be reality, I suppose. <laughs> you know? And the other thinking about the way that I know my mind twists things, and, and you know, I've been told most of my life that I have poor judgment. And uh, I know today that, that it's part of my, my strange mental defect. Not that that lets me off the hook, but um, there was a college professor once talking about the ills of alcohol and its effect, physiological effect, on uh, biological tissue, organic tissue. And so we take this beaker and puts in either alcohol and puts some earthworms in there. And he goes on to talk about the chemical side of things. And a little bit later, he holds the beaker up and says, do you see this? And, and, and the flesh is just flaying off the skin of these earthworms. He said, do you see the ills of alcohol on organic tissue? What does this teach us? And the drunk in the back raises his hand. He says, he says all I know, as long as I keep drinking, I'm never going to get worms. <laughs> So, you know, it's really all relative, but uh, I will tell you, I grew up in, uh, in Virginia. I was born to two parents who, um, you know, my dad liked to drink and my mother liked to, likes to shop and eat the way that we drink, and so definitely some ism uh, around and about. And, you know, we talk in the program about being restored to sanity, and I don't know that I ever came from a place where I said I was sane. Um, I always felt my whole life, and I've heard other people share it like this, like everybody... Um, got a how-to guide for, for, for life, and I was the one guy that didn't get that. And, um, you know, I was, I, was, I was very heavy when I was a kid, and I don't think I, you know, had a thyroid thing or whatever like some people. It was just that food was my first addiction. I just would eat, you know. And I was also very uncoordinated, so I wasn't good at sports. And so class kid picked and all that. And so, you know, when an alcoholic mind, is I'm an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. You know, I'm very sensitive. And so it really did. That kind of stuff really bothered me. And, and then when I hit puberty, I shot up and I lost weight. And then um, I found that uh, I could get uh, girls' attention. And then that became a whole other thing. So, I mean, I, I've always looked for something outside of me to validate that I was okay. To validate that I'm okay being me and that, um, that I could be enough. And basically to fast forward... I ended up uh, going to college, and I partied my way through school, my first college, in about uh, four months. 
And it was just a, a whirlwind of, of hedonistic gluttony. If I couldn't eat it, drink it, smoke it, or screw it, I destroyed it. And I was just a mess. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was 18 years old. And then, uh, so basically, I decided, well, you know what I need? I need discipline. And I went to this little military school up in Virginia called VMI, Virginia Military Institute. My family had gone there since the 1800s, and I thought, that's going to fix me. So that's really what I need. I need some structure, darn it. I need some discipline. And, and you know, that I, I didn't realize until I, I got to this program that everywhere I go, I take me with me. And that's always the problem. And so I go to this military school. I parted my way out through the, out of there in a semester. They let me back in. You know, I'm fast-forwarding here. Just anything that, that, that could happen, um, happen, drink every night still, even there. And I can remember when things got really bad. Um, I was a first classman. I was a senior. And I'd gotten into some things besides alcohol that I think is the reason why I got sober at 23 and not later, if ever. Um, I like stimulants, and um, I like to, to smoke them, and I'll, and I'll leave it at that. What was really bad, too, I like to mix psychedelics with them. So it was really rough that summer before my senior year at that college. Um, I would be up three days at a time, and I would be on these psychedelics, and the carpet would be doing this. And, um, and, I, would, and I would run out of my stimulants, so I'd get on the carpet and start farming, and the carpet was doing this, and I'd forget why I was down there, and I'd sit there for like three hours just watching the show. And then, then my back and my knees would start to get sore, and i go, what the hell am I doing? i get up, get back in the sofa chair, see the pipe, and go, oh, that's right. And i get back down there for another three hours. Um, it was really unmanageable, and, uh, and I was very sore, very sore. And, uh, and then the paranoia, I thought there was like, you know, carpet cleaning van and one driveway and something else, and I just knew they were watching me. And uh, I can remember running to my parents' house with a big steak knife because I thought there was uh, an FBI agent in uh, their master walk-in closet. So I, I had some problems. And, um, but anyway, I like to mix the, 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 the alcohol for sure. And I, I've always loved alcohol. I remember one time trying to explain to my mother why alcohol was so great. I'm like, I don't understand how people don't think more of alcohol. It's just this magic elixir that you just drink and you just feel it go down into your stomach and tingle at the tips of your fingers and toes and you just and you feel so warm and so safe and so powerful. How can you? And, and the more I explain things, she's going to go, oh, okay. The more horrified she looked on my face. Like, what is wrong with you? You know? And I didn't understand. I thought I was fairly articulate. I thought, you know, I thought I was making my point, you know, fairly, fairly well. And, um, so when it all came crashing down, basically, um, to give you a frame of reference, again, I'm in a military school, okay? Uh, you get demerits. That is a, that's the discipline system. So um, let's see. If you don't have your shoes shined during an inspection, that's two demerits, okay? Um, you can't, if you miss class, that's a big one. That's like 10. That's huge. It's not worth it. So you didn't skip class like, like at a normal school. It's just not worth it. Um, you could get 16 demerits in a month. Anything over that, you had to march penalty towards, okay? So everybody have a frame of reference? Say yes. Okay, so now, my last semester at this school, um, because of drinking and these other things and, and not being, I mean, I was missing like every formation, it was crazy. Where's Waldo was big at the back then? I didn't know this. Someone later told me they did a, a Where's Paul uh, thing on the back of the school newspaper because I literally, no one just knew where I was. It was crazy, which is, which is insane given a military environment where you have accountability formations like every few hours. And... Um, Basically, my last uh, demerit period at that school, I had 394 demerits. <laughs> and I knew they were going to kick me out. And uh, so I loaded myself up. This, I had this barn jacket, and I put all kinds of stuff, all kinds of party favors in there and, and got a, a case of whiskey. And I, I ended up going to uh, this Connections house in town in Lexington, Virginia. God bless it. It's a small little college town. So, I mean, there aren't really a lot of bad neighborhoods, but there's one, and that's where I was. And, and so they called my mother, and they said, look, your son's AWOL from Thanksgiving break, from Thanksgiving furlough, we can't find him. And she said, well, he said he thought he was going to get kicked out. And he said, well, to be candid, he is. We just can't find him to do it. <laughs> um, and so, basically, um, my poor mother drove three, three and a half hours up to find me, driving around this area, sleeping in her car. I mean, it was crazy. At one point, she got close, so I shot out the back door, ended up at this motel, and um, and that was a that was a that was a turning point for me. I woke up that morning, and I walked outside to smoke a cigarette, and um, still a little bit of alcohol left, still had a little bit of the other stuff left, but it usually didn't happen. I mean, I would, if I ever had anything left, it's because I passed out, one because I was like, oh, maybe I'll do some of this tomorrow. Um, 
And it was one of those deals. You know, for three days, there's a point your body just says, we're done. You know, and you just, whatever. And, um, but I can remember going out on that porch and smoking a cigarette at 7 o'clock in the morning at this motel and seeing cars go by and people going to work. And, 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 and across the way from me was this, like, um, it was like a Chevron and a Burger King had a kid. You've seen those before? Like, in rest areas and stuff? And, and, and there were people pumping gas and getting breakfast for their kids and stuff. And, and that, that shouldn't have been anything strange. But because of the way I'd been living my life, it was like I was, I, was, I was watching an alien ritual from another planet. I mean, I was at the point living my life where when I woke up and I looked at the clock, I couldn't have told you if it was 5 p.m. or 5 a.m. If the sun was on the horizon, I didn't know if it was going down or up. When I came out of my hole sometimes, I felt like Cracula. I was like, ah, you know, I don't want to see the sun. I mean, it was just, I, I, I just couldn't appreciate normal things. And... And I just, I never felt so lonely because the chemicals stopped working, the alcohol stopped working, and, um, and I just felt so detached from the human race. I knew I was going to get kicked out of school. And uh, my dad had pretty much disowned me at that point uh, based on a conversation we'd had. And uh, full self-pity, I went back into this room and I had a razor blade that I'd used for, for some things and I was going to cut my wrist. And the only thing I can remember thinking was to cut long ways, not across. I was taught this is a cry for help and this is... I don't want to be here anymore. And I, and I really didn't want to be here anymore. And I don't know what made me do it, but I looked at my watch. It was something about, you know, I knew I was born March 6th at 6.16 in the morning, 1974. And I just wondered what, what was going to be on the other side of the dash. And I looked at my watch, and the only thing that saved my life was there was a little four in the day hand. And what I will tell you is December 4th, 1996... November 4th is my mother's birthday. And God allowed someone who was selfish and self-centered, who still struggle with it sometimes, did, it certainly then did not have the capacity for empathy, period, to be able to, God opened a small window and cleared the waters enough for me to think about somebody other than myself and allowed me to think about what that would do to my family, allowed me to think about what, how that would impact my mother every year on her birthday. And say, God, I can't do that. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm, I, I can't do that. And I called her. And she came and she, she picked me up and I went to treatment. So I met, I went to treatment and I met a girl. <laughs> and I was like, this is going to be great. Um, wow, because I got to tell you, it was, it was starstruck. It really was love at first sight. And December 6th, 1996, um, you know, Nancy and I met and we became fast friends, and, and there was a romantic connection there. I know no one can relate to, to any of that. And we were going to, and it was going to be great, because see, we were going to help each other get sober. We were going to get sober together. <laughs> what, what, what's better than that? We're both starting this new life. I mean, she did the illicit substances I did, as well as drink, and da-da-da. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so we end up at an N.A. convention in Virginia Beach, Virginia. It is held the first weekend of January every year at the Cavalier Hotel. Yet, so I don't know what that was about. <laughs> God's like, speed it up. Um, so Nancy and I are down there. Now, this is crazy, and I'm wearing this badge, and I still have the badge for the convention. Now, you got to, we're surrounded by hundreds of recovery people. We thought, what could be better? We're going to go to this convention, right? So, so you got to picture this. There's a little restaurant in the hotel, like there are in many hotels, and we're sitting there surrounded by hundreds of people in recovery. I mean, in any sense, I don't know how any does their, like, districts and stuff, but there are people from Pennsylvania to South Carolina, okay? So we're sitting there, and we go to order. Should, should have been easy. We're just going to get dinner. We just checked in. This is low-hanging fruit. This should have been a softball. We're just going to eat, you know? And she looks at me like to qualify before she orders her beverage. And she says, well, I know I can't smoke uh, that anymore, but um, I can still drink. And she says, I'll take a Jack and Coke. Now, if I had any real recovery, I should have just, like, got up and just ran or something. And I didn't. I have such a fragile ego, especially when it comes to women and the way I perceived and received by women. It's like, well, I don't want to be a, a wimp. You know, if she's going to get a drink, I'm going to get a drink. Damn it. And so I said, well, I'll take a Jack and Coke, too. You're not going to best me. I mean, yeah, real recovery-centered behavior. <laughs> and um, so here's the crazy part. I want you to picture this. We're walking around mingling with people with, with alcoholic beverages at a convention, at an NA convention. And, and 
thinking it's okay. Sick enough to think it's cool. Like, not cool, like, too cool for school, but like, it's okay. Like, this is copacetic. <laughs> and, 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 and I can remember, we got three very distinct reactions from people. Okay? <laughs> I'm just telling, this is just how it was. And so, one group of people that we would saunter up to and engage, you know, where are you guys from? Yeah, we've got 30 days. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they would smell this, and that one of three things would happen. Either they would look terrified, like, Oh my God, we're, like, we're looking at the face of the disease or, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, they would look angry. Try not to curse up here. They look angry, like they wanted to go out and take us outside, me specifically because I'm the guy, and beat me up. Almost like we were two, like, passerby staying at the hotel for some other reason and, like, let's go mess with these people and get drinks and, like, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the third reaction we got, basically people were like, nah. Because who would do that, right? Think of their noses playing tricks on them, because who would do that? <laughs> and so that, that, was, that, was, that was a colorful evening. And, um, and so I remember calling downstairs to the convention. Two days in, I was doing Drunken Dial. And, um, <laughs> and this guy answered the phone, and I was like, I need help, and I love her, and she's at this place, and uh, I believe her. And, and this guy was like, I don't know, sounded like X1 percenters. He's like, this is Chainsaw. And I was like, oh, uh, hi, Chainsaw. You know, I'm crying. I'm just, you know, drunk. And I was like, you got to come and get me. He's like, if you want recovery, you got to come and get it. So you come downstairs. And I'm like, well, I guess this isn't happening. And I hung up. <laughs> I was terrified. Oh, 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 God, I couldn't imagine a worse thing, you know. And uh, so I moved on from Chainsaw. And um, my dad, fast forward some more, my father got in a horrible car accident. I'd been kind of relapsing. And Oh, and by the way, somebody talked about non-alcoholic beer earlier. I, I was taught non-alcoholic beers for non-alcoholics. Um, I tried that, too, and I would drink that until I just wanted the regular beer, and I'd drink that until I wanted other stuff. And anyway, but so my dad got in a horrible car accident, shattered his pelvis, almost died. He was in a coma for six months. And I passed out on the couch, and they tried to wake me up to go to the hospital, and uh, and, and it's like I wouldn't, I couldn't wake up. And I can remember going, going, uh, going there. Couldn't be a support to my family. I'm drinking and using drugs in the bathroom, and uh, we thought my dad was going to die. And my mom didn't know what to do, and she was ready to kick me out of the house. She'd go to the hospital every day, and I would look for things around their house to pawn because I'd been long since cut off. You know, I was a college student, so I didn't have a job, I didn't have any money, I didn't have anything. So I would just look for stuff to pawn. And I would um, have things brought to my house and left in my mailbox um, or on the doorstep. And my mother at one point was crying, just, I mean, she was breaking down, sobbing, holding me, hugging me, saying, please stop doing this. Please, please, your father might die. I don't know what I'm going to do. Please, please, I need you. And, and I didn't have the capacity to care. That's what, that's what alcoholism did to me. And I just hugged her and patted her because I knew that's what I needed to do to get her to go out the door so I could keep doing what I needed to do. <laughs> And um, finally, she had enough and was ready to kick me out. And a friend of the family had gone to Talbot down by the airport, Talbot uh, Recovery Center. And so I ended, up, I ended up being shipped down to Talbot in March, March 21st, 1997. I came down to Talbot. And I spent six months in a 90-day program. <laughs> Some of you didn't get that. And I spent six months in a 90-day program. <laughs> Anybody remember the golf club? Yeah. That's the last place I ever took a drink. I was two months in treatment, had a good family week, and went out to celebrate. <laughs> um, and I was drinking Long Island iced teas and shots of gold slaughter because you have to have balance. In the <laughs> it's a balance in all things, not just the alcohol. And um, so, yeah, so I had to cook a little longer. There was one point, I kind of did the circuit tour treatment centers because there was one point they said, okay, we, we don't think you're ready to graduate yet. And I'm like, ah, oh, come on, I've been here like five months. And they said, listen. We're, we want to send you to this program in Montana. I was 23 at the time. And it's called Wilderness Treatment Center. It's for boys 14 to 24. We think you need that, that experience. And when you come back, we'll let you graduate and go to our three-quarter house. And I was like, okay. And it was kind of cool. We, we did uh, rappelling, and we did groups on top of mountains, and we made our own beef jerky before we went up into this like <laughs> wilderness adventure. And there was one part that was kind of scary. It was called your solo, where they drop you off in a secluded place, and they give you like a big freezer, Ziploc freezer bag full of Chex Mix, uh, they put you by a water source, you get a, a, a tarp and a sleeping bag, and they're like, here's a pen and a piece of paper, we'll be back in four days, right at four step. So that was kind of scary. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, you're like, I don't have time to read. Well, you can't say that in that situation. Um, so, so did that, and that was actually a pretty cool deal. Came back, and then I uh, was in three quarters, and um, my, you know, the other part of me that. Um, that likes attention got involved and ended up sleeping with a stripper with 30 days and they frown on that at Tablet Recovery Residences. <laughs> and um, they asked me to find another place to go. And they said, and see, again, I didn't have a career. I was a college student. Like, I, I had no autonomy. I couldn't. And they, they said, well, but you'll still be under our graces if you go to St. Jude's in Midtown. So I really did have, like, the, I mean, Talbot's a place where it's, like, for doctors. My, my, one of my roommates was a billionaire biochemist from Washington State. You know, people play golf. There's a pool there. St. Jude's is not like that. Anybody know about St. Jude's? <laughs> okay. You know, I can't have a car. I mean, you know, three roommates. Uh, we're homeless the day before, and they're there on, on municipal grants and whatever. And I needed that. I really did. And, um, and that, was a cool, that was a cool deal. And I, I just uh, I started working on some of that other stuff. And uh, every everything that I did, um, you know, worked for me. And that's where I met my sponsor, Jay. Some of you may know him. He hasn't been around for the last five, six years. But Jay B um, was, a, was a really, really special man to me. And I saw him speak at the heavy hitters meeting one Saturday. And he spoke on sponsorship. And he just had this light about him, you know. And I, and I just, and I was just drawn to it like a moth to the flame. And, I, and we really talked. I really wanted what, what he had. And I walked up to him after the meeting, and I said, will you be my sponsor? And he went from you know, laughing and joking, and he got real serious for a minute. He said, that depends. Um, he said, are you willing to do what I, what I ask you to do? Um, and I was like, yeah. And he's like, are you willing to do it when I ask you to do it? And I said, yeah. And he goes, are you ready to get started right now? I was like, uh, okay. And, he's like, and then he smiled again. He's like, okay, great. Let's get started. Um, <laughs> This is really funny. And, and he said, we're going to do something very few people do in a 12-step program. And I said, okay, what's that? He said, we're going to work all 12 steps. <laughs> I thought he was kidding. Um, little, you know, obviously, I found out later, for those of you that have been around. And, uh, and Jay and I started this journey. And I can remember the first time he picked me up from St. Jude's to hit a meeting. You know, I just met the guy. So I didn't really know him that well. So he pulls up in his carpenter's van. And I, I remember I opened the passenger door. And I started a little small talk. And I just said, so how was your day? That's a softball, right? And he just said, ah, it's been better. I said, oh, yeah, what happened? He said, I lost my job today. And I was like, oh, my God. I was, like, embarrassed for the guy. I was embarrassed that I'd asked. Like, I felt really uncomfortable. I said, man, what are you going to do? He goes, what do you mean, what am I going to do? He goes, I'm just going to get another job. It's fine. He goes, I was looking for a job when I found that one. Come on, get in the car. Let's go to a meeting. Like, I was like, oh, my God. This, this is why I bought this guy for my sponsor. I mean, I didn't know how to cope with anything. Like, I... I felt like I had to call 911 when I ran out of toilet paper. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> handle a job loss? And I'll tell you only because I think I may forget to tell you later. Um, the way things come full circle, I lost my job um, in April of, of last year. And that was a really tough thing. And um, I was going to meet a sponsee for the first time at the VA hospital. I just moved down here from Virginia. I didn't come back to Virginia. And I, and I remember I picked up this sponsee, and we were supposed to, it was our first meeting. And he goes, how was your day? And I told him I had, that I'd had better because I lost my job. And he, got, he looked really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, you know, we can do this another time if we've got things you need to do. And I go, this is exactly what I need to do. Please, this is good. And uh, so that was kind of wild. I didn't see that coming, but that was a cool deal, you know. And my sponsor, he walked me, he, he held my hand, he walked me through that book, and he told me the answer was in the book, and that everything else was my opinion. And then that's okay, so my opinions are right too, so are yours. But if I wanted to know what the real deal was, I had to look in the literature. And, and we went through, we did, and we did that stuff. And the way I like to think of the third step is, um, because, you know, he's not around anymore. He decided at one point that he, um, was a big fish in a small pond, and he needed more than just recovery people in his life, and he's just not around anymore. For the next three years, when I would come to Atlanta on business, we'd hook up and share a meal together and talk, because we had more than just recovery in common. And I always say, hey, you doing okay? He's like, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> and um, a couple years ago, we stopped returning anybody's phone call. I called him tonight and left him a message just to say hi. I don't know if he listens to them, but about once every three or four months, I just call because I hear his voice on the voicemail and just say hi, you know? Because it's not about him. I heard a man named Bill, Bill, Bill S., who is a, a, a longtime member of this program, say, 
on my best day as a sponsor, my best day, I just get to be a messenger boy. Just get to be a vessel for the message. That's it. We don't graduate about that. And, and, and it's like a prism. You think of like, you ever see the Swarovski crystal store like in the mall or whatever, right? Or, you know, they've got these, you know, a prism, right? These hunks of, of glass and they're, and they're cut as such. That when you put them in the light, they're beautiful. They refract the different colors of the rainbow. And they really are beautiful to behold. But if I take it out of that light, it's just a hundred glass. And if my channel is not clear, and I'm not living in the program instead of just talking about it, then I'm just a hunk of glass. And it's like when I come in and I do that third step, I'm asking God to take all of me out of the way so that he can shine through me to, to show others how great he is. Because it's not about the glass, it's about the light that comes through, right? And 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 it was it was uh it's been tough to see people over the years um you know, go back out and realize that the light is still here. And on my best day, I get a chance to be a vessel for it, and that's it. And, um, and we can still, you know, love those people and uh, whatever, and I'm still grateful for what he, he gave to me and brought to me. Um, I'll tell you, when I did a four-step with him, it was really powerful. There's a part in the 12 and 12 where it talks about making a list of our assets and defects. My sponsor calls them character qualities, you know, my current sponsor. And we were up at Lake Lanier, and we were doing this fifth step. This fifth, my first fifth step took probably six, seven, eight hours. I don't even know. It was a long time. And he said, all right, pull out your list. And he told me, he said, it's a full moral inventory, not an immoral inventory. And he showed me in the 12 and 12, so when his opinion about where it talks about assets, it's, it's, I think they refer to it as assets and liabilities, if I'm using the exact wording in the 12 and 12. And he said, I want you to write all your defects that you glean from this list that you put together of all your resentments. And on the other side, you have to write your assets. What's good about you? And the thing was, I was a cocky SOB when I got here, and I can still be sometimes. But I couldn't, I couldn't legitimately look at you without my chest pulling out and tell you anything I really thought was good about me, and that was tough. But I found that I could, I wrote down some things. I put that I could be kind, I could be gentle, I could be um, helpful, you know, and, and some other things. And, um, and so he had me read this list. And I read that stuff, the good and the bad. He said, what do you think I'm going to tell you? I said, I guess that these, these defects that I've been living in, that's who I am today. And I'm here working this program so that I can, because I've got little seeds maybe of this good stuff, and, and I can foster and nurture that, and then that will become me. He said, no. He said, on the right-hand side of the page, your defects, oh, that's not who you are. Those are just things that you've done. Those are behaviors you've engaged in. He said, the left side of the page, that's who you are. <clears throat> He goes, that's who, he, goes, that's, he goes, on the left side of the page, that's all, all I ever see when I see you now, when you're me. He said, everything you've been looking for your entire life, and alcohol and drugs and women and food, everything you've been looking for in this program has been inside you the whole time. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me that earlier? You saved me a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> And he said, because you wouldn't have believed it, you'd have left. This miracle wouldn't have been able to happen for you because you have to do the work. And, um, you know, I heard another speaker one time say that they asked Michelangelo how he carved that beautiful statue of David. And he said, it's easy. I just carved away all the parts of rock that weren't the statue. It's like, that's what I was taught. That's what we do here. It's not that I'm bad and I come in to get good. It's that I'm sick and I come in to get well. It's that I've got to get off all the crap to be that pure child of God that I was always meant to be, that I caked on all the mud and the dirt and the shame and the self-loathing over top of it to shield me. And um, and, and I look at it like a gutter downspout. You, guys, you know what I'm talking about? Like on the side of a house, you know, the water comes down and it channels out. And when I get in here, I've got leaves and pine needles and dead birds and all kinds of stuff clogging it, and the light can't come out through. And I do a formal fourth through ninth step, and it's like a giant pipe cleaner from heaven to push all that crap out so I can be a channel for what I'm supposed to be. And then we and then um, and then we talked about uh, women because I wanted to date at a certain point, and uh, I had about a year, and I'd already done you know been through all the steps and stuff, and, and I said, hey, I want to date. And it reminds me of a joke about the guy who says, hey, sponsor, I got a year ready to date. Can I date? And he goes, no, you can't date. He goes, oh, come on, why not? He's like, because you're married, you idiot. <laughs> I was not married at the time. And so I wanted to date, and I've been dating below the radar. That's a cool thing. When you're new, young, and newly recovered, it's like get out of jail free card. You're not a predator. You're just a dumb kid, you know? <laughs> I, 
had, I had old timers co-sign my stuff. Oh, you're done. Go ahead and you know, get it out while you can, you know? Uh, I was like, okay, great. Yeah, the Triangle Club was good to me. But I was, uh, just being honest, the late 90s was a fun time in recovery for me. No, but I will tell you, my sponsor got me straight on that one real quick. He got me straight on that real quick. He said, I'm not judging you. He says, what's it say in the book there? Because it just says, the only question is, are we selfish? Okay. So it doesn't say, it's okay if she's being selfish too. He's like, that's what Friends with Benefits is called. I don't think that was a thing back then. I mean, it was a thing, but they didn't call it that. I don't think they called it anything. Um, I was like, oh, and if I wanted to be more noble, it'd be like, you know, there's, it, talks in, <laughs> it talks in the 12 and 12 uh, in the sixth step about um, speaking dreams of romance while hiding lust in a dark corner of her mind. That is totally me. I will just admit it. And, um, and I was like, so if I wanted to get noble and say, oh, but I really care about her, you know, and anyway. Because um, there's a part of me like, wouldn't it be great to care? And I kind of care. I care about, yeah, I care. yes, I care. And <laughs> I got this. Um, and he'd say, well, and then he'd, and then he'd, and then he'd hit, me, hit me with something else. Like, but what do you have to bring to a relationship? You know? Oh, crap. So it's like he, he cut me off on, on either route. And he did do this one thing. When it was finally time for me to be ready to date, I thought, <clears throat> I said, I want to date. I think I'm ready. I'm sponsoring people. I've been through all the steps. I got one amends left. Let's do this. Um, and he said, okay, I want you to write a list of everything you want out of a partner. Anything you want. And I'm like, anything? Because I knew it was one of these sponsor tricks, but I didn't know, you know, kind of <laughs> navigate it. Like, <laughs> no one else is going to see this right now. Um, so he said, yes, anything you want out of a partner, put it down. And I'm like, well, this is great. This is awesome. I, you know, so I, I mean, I wrote all kinds of stuff. And, and some that I'll share is um, I put, you know, I wanted someone who was spiritual. I wanted someone who was kind and loving. Someone who was always giving of themselves. Someone who was beautiful but didn't know it. Um, <laughs> someone who was patient and tolerant and not judgmental. And just at a pure heart. Oh, man, I'm ready. And so I bring him this list. And he said, okay, you got the list. And I'm like, I've got my list. And he looked and he's like, okay. He goes, what do you think I'm going to tell you? And I, and I was wrong, but I said, okay. I said, you're going to tell me there's no perfect person and that I need to pare down the list some and whatever. He said, no. He goes, Paul, there are people out there with all these qualities. That's not what I'm going to tell you at all. He said, no, they're not perfect because I didn't say what, what character defects would they have. They're going to have some other stuff. But for the good, there are people out there with all of this on the good side. So I started getting hopeful. I was like, all right. He said, but the question I have for you all these traits you want out of a partner, how many of these things are you bringing to the table? It's like, oh, man. Hit me right between the eyes. Because he said, you see, if you want that, you can have that. But to get that, you got to be that. I was like, ah! <laughs> so he's like, to answer your previous question, no, you can't, Dave, because you just told me that's what you wanted, and you're not going to attract that the way you are right now. So if I'd have known that, I'd have sandbagged the list. <laughs> but, uh, I just stay. You know, but I tell you, it's, it's cool the way things happen. I, you know, I'm married today. I met this beautiful, and she really is. It's really cool. Um, reminds me of this uh, Mad Magazine cartoon I saw once where the guy was moping around, and the person says, what's wrong? You look so sad. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I just broke up. And he goes, oh, no, what happened? He goes, well, I kept telling her I didn't deserve her, and finally one day she believed me. You know? <laughs> um, sometimes I feel like that's going to happen with my wife because she's so great. And um, I, she was my waitress at a restaurant. And uh, back in 2000, and I asked her out. And on our third date, I took her to a meeting. And she said it really freaked her out. So I'm like, okay, there's this thing that I'm involved in, and you need to know about it, and whatever. But I did say this. I said, listen, it's really important you understand. This is a third date. I said, I said, listen, what I'm about to expose you to is this is not something I do. This is part of who I am. And it's a non-negotiable. If you're okay with that, we can keep dating. And if you're not, it really is okay, too. And she walked into church with me. Yeah. And now, come full circle, our, tenth, our, our 13 years of being together um, was about two weeks ago. Our 10-year wedding anniversary is in August, and we have three children, ages seven, uh, four, and three. You know, And, and that's what recovery's done for me. Um, she started going to Al-Anon a few years ago, and it's been tremendous for us. It's funny, she joked, when she first went to Al-Anon, we were dating. I'm like, yeah, something you should do since we're in recovery. She went and she came back. She's like, I don't know, I feel bad. I just always women are bitching about the alcoholics in their lives. I don't have any problems with you. And then we got married, and then all of a sudden, and then of course there were problems. 
I will own the problems, though. You know what I mean? I, she definitely was. Uh, she definitely was uh, in the right. But no, no, it's been really good for us. And um, I don't know. Recovery's a trip. I will tell you another cool thing. Uh, d- d- December fourth, nineteen ninety six, on my mother's birthday, when I had a razor blade to my wrist. Um, I decided one day when I was working in Atlanta, I stayed here for three years after I got out of treatment. I decided I want to try to go back to VMI and finish my degree. And um, and I talked to the dean there who um, said, well, you need to get some recent academics. But at the time, I was running a sales office in Midtown, doing really well. And he said, but you need some recent academics. So within two weeks, I closed up my office. Not my office, but I, somebody else took the position. I closed up my apartment. I closed up my life here. Moved back in with my parents in Virginia. Enrolled in classes at um, another college. Drove three hours up to VMI to make sure the credits would transfer. And... Um, and, I, and, I, and a cool thing started happening while I was in that semester getting academic experience. I would go to a meeting, and this happened one time. I shared about trying to go back to VMI, and this guy came up to me. Never saw him before, never saw him since at that meeting. He said, you know, I went to VMI. I'm class of 82. I was a battalion commander. I was the Honor Corps president. He goes, I was a swim team captain. I'd be happy to write you a letter of recommendation to get back in. I was like, that'd be great, you know? And, um, and I can remember going up there to petition to get in. There were three people trying to get back into school because the second time I was kicked out, it wasn't a suspension. It was a you know termination. And, um, and I was able to share about what you guys taught me. And I was able to share not from a place of being manipulative or conniving, but to say, it's really okay if you don't let me back in. Because I'd gotten enough self-esteem to the point where it really was okay. I wouldn't have been crushed. I needed closure at that piece of my life. I said, look, I've got straight A's now. I could go anywhere, but it would mean a lot to come back here and finish. And the cool thing was December 4th, 1996, I had a razor blade to my wrist. December 4th, 1999, three years to the day, I got the phone call that said, come on back. We'd like to have you back. And um, I got to go back, and I feel like people always talk about it'd be cool to live a certain part of your life over. I really feel like I got a chance to do that. You know? I, and I didn't get any demerits. It was a cool, and I didn't have to try that hard. I just, like, went to class. I got, I got went to meetings. I was able to show a couple of people this. It was funny, this, this one guy that was here, because the guys who were rats were first-year people, we're now seniors when I came back, and they're like, we remember you from before, and you were a mess. And what'd you do? And one guy, uh, it was funny, one guy came to my room, I thought it was a tw- like I was doing a 12-step call, and I started talking to him about, you know, what I'd done or whatever, and he seemed a little bit, now I was like, are you okay? And he was sweating pretty badly. And he said, he goes, you know what, I am on mushrooms right now. <laughs> We're going to pick up on this tomorrow. You can get some rest. Um, but it was really cool. It was really cool to introduce some people into the rooms. And um, I can remember one time, and, and I'd always gone to the Atlanta Men's Workshop. I'd come down from Virginia because I got sober down here. You know, went back up to finish school. And I can remember one time I brought a sponsee down, and we did an 11-hour, it was insane, uh, fist step at, at the Rock Eagle. Anybody heard Rock Eagle Men's Workshop? Incredible experience if you've ever been. I go religiously. Um, and I had this guy, right? And we skipped dinner. We usually go to dinner in town and do these other fun things too. And I'm like, no, this is important. This is recovery. You know what I mean? I'm trying to be a channel for this guy. Let me, you know. And we did this. I mean, we went in for the main speaker meeting Saturday night, got done, kept going. It's like 1.30 in the morning. I'm like falling asleep sitting there with the guy. But I'm like, I'm doing my part, you know, to be there with him and, and to connect on these things. Finally, at the end, it's something I was taught to do that I always say. And I always say, look, all right, we're done. We've gone over what you're to do now for your quiet hour and where you do your six and seven step prayer. Is there anything that you have not told me? Usually, nothing comes up. Or something like, all right, and this is a big secret, and it's cool too, right? This guy goes, yeah, I smoked pot two weeks ago. Does this count? <laughs> really? <laughs> really, Joe? <laughs> you stole 11 hours from me. I can never get back. And it was so funny. I was so darn tired, and we really did do some work. I was really confused for a minute. I'm like, does this count? Does it not count? We probably should do another one. <laughs> anyway. I was like punch drunk at that point. But, um, oh, I gotta tell you about my ninth step. You know, I made amends to people, and uh, my last event, and this is before the internet was real big, I guess, 1998, um, when I did this, and it was the last guy on my amends list. It was a kid we pick, I picked on in school, and, and kind of bullied a little bit, you know, and, and, um, and just did some not nice things to this guy. I felt horrible about it, and he was the last guy on my list. And um, 10 years later, 10 years later, um, this is before Facebook even got big. I think MySpace was kind of moved going on, and I think it was like 07. Yeah, it was 2007. And um, 
somebody, uh, short story shorter, had said, this guy wants to have this reunion of our middle school. Like, who does middle school reunion, right? <laughs> St. Mary's. They were like, literally, my graduating class was like 18 people. And, um, but whatever. I was like, okay, that's fine. I still live in the area, whatever. And, um, and I was like, who's getting this thing together? And this guy was one of the people. And I, thought he, I did not think that he would want to see any of us, quite frankly. Especially me. And I said, really? And I said, you have his phone? So she gave it to me. And I called, and I was finally, finally able to call this guy, because this has been bothering me for years. And said, um, I'm really sorry for what I did to you back then. And uh, the only thing that I'll ask, if there's anything I can do to make your life better, that you let me. And you guys taught me that. I didn't have that. I didn't care before I got here. And I was nothing on Facebook. But it's cool. And, um, <laughs> and so... I will tell you, um, I had a really hard time last year. I was feeling really good. I've sponsored lots of people over the years. I feel like I work the program. I do service work. I do all these things where I feel like I'm living it, not just talking about it. And um, I lost my job, I told, as I told you, April of last year. And it became very, very, uh, it became a very tough time for me and my family. And um, it was a strange thing because I was doing, I was, I, in hindsight, I can say I wasn't practicing these principles at home. Because I was still sponsoring guys. I was still doing service work. I was running a step workshop. Um, I was a GSR for my men's home group on Saturday mornings. Uh, I was sponsoring five, six guys. And I felt like I was doing the deal. But, you know, I was in a depression. And my wife would come home and she was teaching to try to keep up, you know, with the bills. And like, really? You didn't clean the house today? You just laid in bed? Yep, yeah, but I got to go work with some guys so I can feel better about me. And, uh, you know, and really, that took a toll on my anger. I didn't realize anger was ever really an issue for me. But it started getting worse. And it, and it was really tough. And, and I will tell you, I picked up 15 years sober September 24th of last year. I drove up somewhere with asked to speak at this event, and I went up and spoke, and I came home. And two days later, my wife took the kids and said, we're going to stay with my parents. And you need to work on you so we can come back. 15 years sober. I was devastated. It was a shame. So I had to look at me. I had to do some extra stuff. I had to go, I went to anger management counseling, went to see a therapist, got into couples counseling, and I had to go to the next level, I had to go to the next layer of the onion. I didn't see that coming, you know, and my wife and my children came back. I got a job, brought me back to Atlanta, I got a house full of boxes, I've been back a week, you know, and I've got a lot of history down here with a lot of men uh, that I, I got sober around. And, uh, and it's a gift. It really is. I'm just uh, I'm so grateful to, to be here. Um, it's like when I think about when I think about what this program means and what people have done for me, I think about the story. Anybody remember the story of the man in the hole? Raise your hand if you want to hear it again. <laughs> it's okay if you don't. This just goes faster. So either way. All right, one I'll see me after the meeting. You know, but, but, but to, you know, if you know that story, I mean, it's a powerful story. And, 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 and an alcoholic did what no non, uh, other non-alcoholic could do. I remember one time being at a meeting. I was home from treatment. I was a couple months into town, but I went home to Virginia, and I was at this meeting on a Saturday, and it was all these old people. 23 years old, and I see all these gray hairs, and I'm like, what am I doing here? I don't think, I don't think this is for me. I'm, look, I know I can't drink and do drugs anymore, but I don't know that this is the answer. Thank you for the knowledge about myself and my condition. I think I'm going to figure something out. You know, Godspeed to the rest of you. And, and, and I'm not saying any of this. I'm thinking this stuff, right? I leave the meeting. There definitely is no meeting before and after the meeting for me at that time. I just shot out. This guy chased me down. He chased me down. He said, man, I just want to tell you, I am so excited to see you here at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, you know what? I'll tell you. He said, I'm 33 years old today. I got 10 years sober. He goes, i got to be honest with you. When I got here at 23, this is how I felt. And oh my gosh, this guy went on to recount all the stuff that was in my head. Like he was psychic. And I thought, oh, but what am I going to do with all these old people? And I can't get along. And how am I going to meet somebody? And how am I, I got to go to these meetings for the rest of my life? And he goes, man, I'm just so glad I hung in there. And AA is incredible. And your life is going to become unimaginably cool. And I am so excited you're here. And that's what it took for me to say, okay, maybe I'll try it a little bit longer. You know, and I've had these little touches along the years. I can remember when I first went to Talbot, my mother called an attorney. Now, we have had a family attorney for forever. 
I don't know why she called this other guy. She didn't really know him. She's friends with his wife. And she said, listen, I don't know what to do. My son's been in an accident. He's got a subpoena to appear in court. He's in long-term treatment in Atlanta. I'm not sure why I'm telling you this, but I don't know what to do. He said, it's okay, Susan. I've been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for 12 years. I'd be happy to help your son. You know that's going to happen. And these different things, if I can just stay out of my own way, if I can pray for God to just show me what I'm supposed to do and then do it, that's the hard part. And then go, go through and, and take the actions. That's the difficult part for me a lot of times. But I've got to remember the answers and the steps. It's not in coming to these meetings. Meetings help. Meetings are huge. They're, they're crucial. They're key. They are vital. As in it is vital to breathe, to live. But meetings are where I get the fellowship. And the program, the way I look at it, it's like lifting weights. Can you ever lift weights? I used to treat I think I think all guys that go to treat with lift weights and then you get out and you stop doing it. And um, <laughs> you just got a lot of free time. And they have a gym. And um, but no, it's like lifting weights. It's like if I go to a meeting of people that that, that are weightlifters, and I think, man, I'm going to get big and buff like these guys. And I hear them talking about different weightlifting techniques and and, 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 and diet dietary supplements and nutritional elements and best practices in the gym. And I'm listening to all that good stuff. I'm like, man, I'm going to be huge. And I leave. And I do that for a few months at a time. And I go home and I go, man, this is BS. This doesn't work. I look the same. And those meetings are a bunch of crap. People do it in AA all the time. But I never got in and picked up a weight. Never got my butt in the chair. So sometimes when I'm with guys and I'm going, you know, hey, let's go hit a meeting tonight and get coffee. That's cool. I go, you know, let's go, let's go lift some weights. It's been a little bit since we've done something. And that helps me too. So I've got to make sure I keep it clear. It's about fellowship and the program. I've got to have both. And, um, and it reminds me of sponsorship. is kind of like there's a story about a guy, a man in a hot air balloon. And the man in a hot air balloon is, is, fly, is riding along, and he comes down, he lowers the hot air balloon, and he says, can you help me? There's a guy on the ground. He says, can you please help me? He goes, I am completely lost. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm late for an appointment. I'm supposed to be somewhere. I don't even know where I'm at. Can you please help me? And... The guy on the ground says, yes, you are 40 degrees west latitude by 73 degrees north longitude. And the guy just kind of looks at him like, seriously. And he says, ah, he goes, you must be a sponsor. And the man on the ground says, well, I am a sponsor. But how did you know? And he said, well, while everything that you tell me is directionally correct and specifically correct, it it helps me in no way with, with what I'm doing. And actually, now I'm later here as a result of having spoken to you. And the guy on the ground says, well, you must be a sponsee. <laughs> and he says, well, I am, but how did you know? He said, well, you're, he goes, you're at, you're, you, you're in, you find yourself in the place that you're in because of a lot of hot air. You have no idea where you're going. You have no idea how you're going to get there. You're in the same exact position you were before you met me, but now all of a sudden, somehow it's my fault. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But I tell you, I love being a sponsor, and it's, it's the only thing that, that, that keeps me sane sometimes. And this will change. I'm hoping one day I can speak to the podium and say this is different, because I want to be as good of a person with my family as I am doing that. But when I, I am at my purest when I'm helping somebody else go through the steps, I'm my best me when I do that. It's not a bad me with my family. I'm just saying I'm not that. And I, I want one day to, to be able to, to have the two align. I'll share one last thing, and then I'll, um, and then I'll let you go. Um, to me, this is a summation about what the third step and the twelfth step look like when they kind of come together about, about living our lives. And the story's about God and the drunk. And the drunk comes to God and he says, God, I want sobriety. Please help me. And God decides to kind of mess with him a little bit. And he says, well, how much do you got on you? And the drunk's like, you mean like money? He says, um, uh, he goes, I, I got 50 bucks. And God says, okay, then for you... Um, Sobriety's going to cost you 50 bucks. And the drunk says, but, but wait a minute. <laughs> if you take my money, he goes, how will I be able to put gas in my car? And God says, oh, you have a car. <laughs> he said, well, then for you, sobriety's going to cost you your car. And the drunk's like, well, wait a minute now. He goes, if you take my car, he goes, how will I um, be able to get to work? And God says, well, um, you have a job? Oh, I didn't know you had a job, too. <laughs> well, this is great. He goes, well, then if you want recovery, you want sobriety? It's going to cost you your job. And the drunk's like, this is going a little fast for me. I'm being honest. He said, um, 
he goes, if you take my job, how am I going to pay my mortgage? And God says, okay, now we're talking. you got a house. <laughs> this is great. This is really good for us. And he said, um, yeah, you got a house. He said, yeah, but God, please don't take my house. And God said, hey, all I'm saying is, because if you want sobriety, it's going to cost you your house. And the drunk said, okay, because he really wants to get sober, you know, and he's desperate. So he says, okay, I'll give you my house. And he said, but I'm, I'm nervous. And God said, why? He said, because if you take my house, where am I going to put my family? And God said, oh, you have a family. The man's getting scared now. And God looks him right in the eyes and he says, if you want sobriety, it's going to cost your family. The man swallows hard. He says, okay. The man broken down, crestfallen, says, God, if you take all that, he goes, what the hell left is my life? God looks at him sternly but kindly. He says, exactly, but if you want sobriety, it's going to cost your life. How bad do you want it? And the man breathes a sigh and he says, well, okay, uh, all right, whatever, whatever you want. And God looks at him and he smiles, cracks a smile. And he says, well, don't make a deal with you. And the, and the drunk kind of looks up with some hope. And he says, I'll give you back that $50. But it's not your money anymore, it's my money. If you want to be sober, if you spend it the way I'd spend it, if it were in my pocket, I'll let you keep it. The drunk says, okay. And he goes, and I'll let you have that car back. But it's not your car anymore, it's my car. You need to only go to places that I would go with you if I were behind the wheel. Can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. He said, I'll give you back that house. But it needs to be a house of love, not of neglect. Can you do that? And he says, yeah, I, I can do that. And he goes, and I'll give you back that family that you abused and neglected. But they're my family. Don't you ever forget that. And I'll tell you guys, I forgot that. Last year I forgot. And, um, and he said, I'll give your life back. It's not your life anymore, it's my life. He goes, but my promise to you is that if you live it the way that I would have you live it, that sobriety will make your life better beyond anything you could ever imagine. And that's the promise I think that we get here now, Alcoholics Anonymous. Thanks for letting me tell my story. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.